biggest fear for an adolescent is written all the way throughout this text. The biggest fear of an adolescent, Jesse? Not fitting in. Is not fitting in. You talked about acceptance. Now to understand how this happens and how this looks and what this feels like, I'm going to have you do an activity. This is an on your own activity and just this is this is not to tax you. These are easy things. This is just to kind of get you feeling what we're going to go over. So everybody if you would take out a, a short piece of paper. I'm going to pass out these papers and I'll just keep them face down. And if you would, no one write on these, write on your own paper. Them face down. Yeah. Everybody have one? If you would, just do them one at a time and I will tell you when to do them. Everybody turn it over. Just do your own work. And this isn't meant to be hard. These are anagrams. Just do the first one only. Go ahead and solve it. An anagram is rearrange the letters to form a word. Just one. Just rearrange those letters to form a word. When you're done, I need to see your hand raised. Okay, keep going. We'll wait. Keep your hands up, please. Just do number one. Don't go on. Don't go on. You, if this isn't meant to be difficult. Okay, put your hands down. Let's just go to number two. Don't even worry about number one. Go to number two, solve that one. Again, when you're done, I want to see your hands up. Everybody's hands down. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do number three. For number three, rearrange the letters, and as soon as you do, go ahead and put your hand up. Here's what you need to know. You were both given two different lists. This side of the room was given these three words. And left side of the room, here you go. They were given bat. What would the word be? Okay. The second one, they were given lemon. Brian, the word? Melon. Melon. They were easy. The trick here was both of you were given the third word, which was the same. The third word was Cinerama, which was American. American. Your first two words on this side of my classroom were not solvable. They were impossible tasks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, but here's what we did this for. I was able to induce something called learned helplessness in the left side of the room very easily within about five minutes. I want you to think about what happened to you, this left side of the room, when you saw the right side of the room raising their hands because they already had the task done. What happened to you during that time? Jory? I felt stupid. You felt stupid? Yeah. Okay. I felt rushed. Felt rushed? Joelle? I was even more confused. You were even more confused because they all got it and you were still struggling. Chelsea? Frustrated. Frustrated. What happened by the time you got to the third word? Because I'm here to tell you, this side of the room is not significantly more intelligent than this side of the room. That was a random assignment. So what happened to show the differences? Why did you have more of a difficult time with the third word, which was the, which was the exact same word? Brian? My confidence was shot. What you experienced was a term called learned helplessness. How many have heard of the term before? Let me see your hands. Learned helplessness is often used in the academic literature to mean what? Jory? Basically, they fail once or can't do something one time, and then they apply that to everything in the future, so all the future applications become skewed by that learned helplessness. And here's the thing, and this is what I want everybody to understand. It's usually only used in the academic research. You'll see it in Ed Psych books. You'll see it in school textbooks when they talk about learning. But I'm going to challenge us to think about how learned helplessness can actually apply to the social scene. Can someone give me an example of how that might look? Tasha? 
It's like when um, a guy asks a girl out and he gets turned down, he's not going to be willing to keep asking girls out, afraid of the... Getting and he down. stops trying. That's correct. Now, I want us to think about girls. We've talked about reviving Ophelia here. I want us to think about how, as we have been going through this book, how does it apply? Think about friendships. Can you induce learned helplessness in friendships? Because it's tough to actually establish and maintain friends. That's a difficult process. Jesse? Um, if a girl sacrifices her morals once in order to gain like, the approval of her friends or a guy, she's more likely to do it over and over. Yes, and I'm just going to put this out there just to be explicit about it. If Carl becomes victimized one time in grade school, is he likely to stand up for himself the next time? No, and then what happens the next time and the next time and the next time? What we know that we have been learning about is girls have a cultural pressure to be quiet. Girls have a cultural pressure not to be angry, not to use their voices. And so if someone is victimized once, if Allison is victimized once, we can take that same concept of learned helplessness and apply it to social relationships. And so the moral of the story is it's very important for girls to practice and to be able to deal with that failure. Because our gut response, what do we do when we fail? Our gut response is to close down. And once you close down, you do not open yourself up for learning any new ways for relationships.